force is strong in my family. My father has it. I have it. My sister has it. You have that power too. singing trains and dancing kitty cats and they got Irish youth facing the troubles and it wasn't something that a lot of audiences were prepared for. It's one of the reasons Sondheim shows don't run very long either. They challenge the audience okay, and sometimes audiences don't like to be challenged. I like the challenge and I like challenging the students and I'm really happy to say that they have risen to the challenge above and beyond. Um, they have been the most wonderful cast and crew to work with. We've had our minor, minor quibbles, and I can't come to rehearsal, I have to work, and I throttle, why don't you look at the schedule, that kind of thing, but overall, it has been the most rewarding experience. Um, I have to do a few thank yous. I'm going to keep it short today, because Mr. Lavery said I embarrass him too much, but... <laughs> <laughs> This show could not exist. Thanks, Ryan. Stop. <laughs> this show could not exist without Brendan Lavery. Uh, he's in the cast, actually. He's playing the priest. And the reason I wanted a teacher is because the characters are all 18, 19, 20 years old, and then they have their mentor, who's a priest who's been around. And it seemed odd to me to cast a student in that role, somebody who's the same age as the rest of the cast. And he. Uh, was at first hesitant because he's got a busy course load and then agreed. Not only is he in the cast though, Brendan has been our technical director. So I had a bunch of ideas in my head and I really refused to let them go and Brendan made them happen. And what you're going to see here would not have happened without him. Um, he was our set designer, he rigged our projector unit. Um, seriously, just couldn't have done it without him. Second person I need to thank is Miss Marianne Jason. She was our producer. Again, me being a diva, I said, I need this, this, and this. We need microphones. Can we do the show without them? Nope. If we have no mics, I'll pull the show. And Marianne produced a sound system for us because she knows what we need, and I have no idea. I just know what I want. <laughs> um, so Marianne went to admin with the technical specifications we needed. Uh, Marianne has been instrumental in getting that stuff set up for us, and again, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here without her. Third is uh, Ryan, who's already made his presence known. Ryan up there on piano was our music director and vocal coach. 
Um, he came in several times to coach the kids, and then when he wasn't here, I did that. But without his help, none of this would happen. Um, because he recorded pretty much the entire score on MP3 tracks that we could use in rehearsal when he wasn't here. Um, and so that's above and beyond the Call of Duty for him as well. Now, some important people in the band. We have some professional musicians in our band. Uh, Genevieve Hunter on synthesizer and secondary keyboards. Is it synthesizer? Is that the proper term now? Synth. Synth. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's our stage manager's piano teacher. She heard we might have needed an extra keyboardist and said, I'll do it, pro bono. And she learned this entire score in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, and this is not easy music. Secondly, uh, Mr. Andrew Nagara, who teaches physics and band at the school. He's the jazz band leader as well as concert band? Yeah. Concert band. Um, he has a degree in guitar, and he's playing electric guitar for us. And, of course, Ryan. But what's really special and important to know is that we have three students who uh, joined our orchestra. On bass guitar, we have Gino Velasco, a grade 10 student, mostly self-taught, who learned this entire score on his own. Um, Gino, give us a bass guitar lick. <laughs> but there's nothing to approximate the sound of a real flute. We have flute and piccolo. Taylor Ramiji, who's a grade 12 student, I put out a call for students and she was the only one that answered and she came in after a weekend of rehearsing and played the overture, which you're about to hear is not an easy piece of music. Taylor, a little lick? <laughs> Grant, Grant Toffany, also a grade 12 student, uh, who, again, learned the score on his own. He listened to the original cast recording a bit, figured out the tempos, that kind of thing. And then the band has only played together as a, as a group, I think, six times. Uh, is that right? Six? I think six times. Um, Grant, give us something. <laughs> A prime example of another program in our fine arts, which is just huge in this school, and that's our band program. I'll acknowledge our, our uh, music director, Jesse Heffernan, who's here tonight, because these kids, there's no way the regular high school student can play this score and learn it on their own, and that's all down to their teacher. Jesse, thank you. I want to thank Cindy Zampa. Cindy uh, is a counselor at the school, used to be an art teacher, and whenever we put out the call, she loves to come and help set, uh, paint sets. So she painted this whole set with the help of another counselor, Lorna Bright, who also used to be an art teacher. Um, Cindy went with the band to Whistler last week, was gone for seven or eight days, and when she came back on Monday this week, I said, oh, we have a new wall for you to paint. <laughs> and she kind of looked at me and said, oh, okay. And, did it, uh, I think, opening day? No, last dress yeah. rehearsal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And lastly, our principal, Mr. Kevin D'Souza, who also, well, trusted me <laughs> smilingly, and hopefully uh, I wasn't doing anything too outrageous, right? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I may be called to the principal's office. <laughs> um, uh, just a quick note, uh, try to not be texting during the show. We had a few issues with that last night. Um, you are permitted to take a few pictures of your son or daughter uh, if you feel the burning desire to, but try to keep the flash off because it is distracting a bit. And please enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Oh, we will have one 20 minute intermission. Thank you.
Be quiet, Bernadette. I shall speak to your mother. Ooh. Derek Copeland. Lay it on me, Father. Ah, uh, well, I don't want to dwell on your dreadful misfortunes, lad, and, well, I'm afraid there's no point in denying this. You're a Protestant. I'm a football. What will be your reply when our opponents call you a dirty, rotten, orange, proddy swine? Which is... Father, I will tell them that religion is the opium of the masses, and that our common enemy is capitalism. Yes. No, no, you won't, you dirty little people. <laughs> tell them we're all God's children underneath, even Protestants. Look at the lot of you. You don't deserve the name of footballers.
let it corrupt you. Stay true to the yourselves and to the promise of your youth. This is who you are. It's up to you what you become.
enough trouble as it is. I've gotten you into trouble? Father O'Donnell thinks you take my mind off football. Yes, so I heard. Do I? No, you don't. I've no time for girls. Father O'Donnell thinks I have it in me to be a professional. Well, there are more important things in life than football, you know. No, there aren't. <laughs> there are. Like what? Oh, I don't know. Just about everything else, really. But who asked you, anyways? Nobody asked me. I thought we were having a conversation. Well, we're not. I told you to go away. With pleasure. I don't even know why I came here anyways. <sighs> Maybe it's because you fancy me. <laughs> don't flatter yourself. I've stood and stood at all sorts of grim sights in my time. It doesn't mean I'm attracted to them. Well, I'm certainly not attracted to you. Well, it's you that keeps bringing up this fancy mark. It seems to me it's on your mind. Not about you, it isn't. Well, good, because I'd hate to disappoint you. Even have challenges in your life as it is. I don't even like you. I reciprocate that emotion entirely.
out. Bit late for the match, aren't you? The other side's already gone home, taking two bloody points with them. Jesus, you've been out to put a bloody crowbar. If you want to tune it down, you just have to twiddle the little knobs. <laughs> this is trick. I see it more as a salvage operation, but with all the riding that's going on, it's no more than common sense to take the car radios out to cars before they get burned. Well, I hope you're only smashing up foreign cars. Our country's in enough trouble as it is. What, with the Japanese starting to make them? Have you seen the Honda Civic? I've got a bigger pair of underpants. <laughs> <laughs> you get caught in the end, you know that, right? And I don't favor Catholic thief's chances in the royal holster and stabby They won't catch me. I have everything planned down to the minutest detail. I'd even had made it in time for the match if I hadn't missed my getaway bus. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, you skiving bastard. We have no sleeper again because of you. That's two games in a row. It won't happen again, lads, I swear. I love my footy as much as the rest of you. In the meantime, I reckon this car radio should raise enough for us to drown our sorrows. How about I treat you? I'd say that's the least you could do. Come out, lads. I promised Mary. Oh, come on, John. I treat with the lads. I promised. For Christ's sake, John. You've only been going out with her for what? A couple of months? And she already has your balls in her fist? If only. <laughs> You're letting the girl wear the trousers, mate. You'll regret it. Just because a fella occasionally considers the wishes of his girlfriend, Thomas, doesn't mean he's being emasculated. I thought emasculation is what you did if you didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs>
boy, Daniel. He scores 90% of our goals. Ah, but he'd be no if it wasn't for me. Chopping up the other side's defense. Where is he anyway? Isn't this supposed to be a training session? Where do you think? Struggling to get out from underneath Mary's thumb. You're just jealous because he's got a girlfriend. Of course I'm bloody jealous. I'm 18, for God's sakes. I shouldn't still be looking for tits in the National Geographic. <laughs> We're in the final, lads. The bloody final. And we're going to win, Mary. I know we are. <laughs> Enough canoodling there, John. You know what Father O'Donnell says about birds and football. Father O'Donnell is a reactionary, anachronistic, old Neanderthal chauvinist. Pardon? She means he's an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Christine, is your mind as dirty as your mouth? That depends on who I'm talking to. Oh, I was thinking, maybe sometime I might see you in the pub. I might let you buy me a drink. <laughs> well, that would be grand, Thomas, but oh no, I just remembered. I'm busy to the day I die. <laughs> hey, I think you pulled her, as if I was serious. I think Father O'Donnell is a great coach. If he can get you to kick a ball, a ball straight, Ginger, he's a genius. Leave him alone. He kicked one straight last week. Oh, yeah, he did. Straight into our own net. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy mistake to make. Daniel shoots, Daniel scores. Daniel dreams, Daniel wakes up. And if you played as hard as you talked, you'd be capped for Northern Ireland. When I play for my country, mate, I'll play for the Republic. Well, that'll be that inaccurate then. Oh, Christ. It's the prods. See ya. He's right. We should head out. We don't want to get into a fight with a final to play tomorrow. If there is a bloody final, the damned army's closed out half the town. I just don't get it. The soldiers? I think the army's supposed to be protecting us from the wolves, isn't it? Of course they are, Bernadette. Funny how they all fly the same flag. Well, I mean, John's right. We can't fight these thugs. Great, so let's get what out of here. What we must do is confront them with nonviolence, like Gandhi or Martin Luther King. What? We refuse to fight, but we refuse to move. You won't be able to move once they've broken your legs. We must link arms, united and unafraid. You are bloody insane. They're going to cover us with bats and bottles and what? We hit them with a vicious force. Where have all the flowers gone? John, talk to her. Mary, we have to go now, please. Why do we have to go? This is our country. Because I love you, Mary. And as your favorite book suggests, love means not getting the crap kicked out of you because your girlfriend's out of her sodding mind. That is so romantic. Come on. The marching season, when the orange lodges of organized unionism assert their right to parade through nationalist streets flying the British flag, where it is seen as a signal of occupation and oppression. Say it takes pride enough things, doesn't it? 
doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does. You know, I always assumed that you Catholic girls were frigid. <laughs> Did you now? Well, I had this crazy idea that you crotty lads were nothing but a bunch of bigots and bowlers. But isn't this great? We're breaking down our barriers, overcoming our prejudices. Us having it off in that back alley, here in fact was a boon for cross-community relations. We're building bridges, so we are. And I'm sure my father would agree with you. Well, he's a very smart fellow. <laughs> then he'd kill you. Well, maybe we shouldn't go public with our peace initiative just yet, eh? I am glad to see you, though, now. Oh, I haven't seen you for ages, not since the beginning of the season. It's hardly surprising, considering your mate Thomas threatened to kill me if I showed up to another match. <laughs> Thomas is no mate of mine. Hello? I think he wishes he was. I see that the lads have made it to the final. I wish I could be with them. If there's a final, God knows what they even play now. You know, I think this whole thing's bloody insane. People going on about Oliver Cromwell and William of Orange. Those guys have been dead for about a million years. I don't care whether I'm Irish, British, or bloody Martian. I just want people to stop throwing bricks at me. Me too. You know what I'm going to do, Chrissy? The second I get the chance? What? Clear up. <laughs> Go where? Anywhere. America, preferably. But I'd settle for the North Pole if it wasn't Belfast. Oh. I'm with you on that, Dal. I've wanted to clear out this place for as long as I can remember. Since the day I was born. That's right. It's when you're born in Belfast.
associating with Protestants. Afy, we're watching you. Who? Who's bloody watching me? Don't you mind who? Just be careful. Leave it, Christine. I'm not scared of him, Del. I know you're not, but I am. Let's go. <laughs> I've spoken with you before, Thomas. There's no place for violence on this team. I won't have it. You can't escape it, Father. Well, that's where you're wrong, lad. All you need is the brains to know that violence is getting us nowhere, and the guts to try something different. You've got the brains and the guts, Thomas. Try and do something good. That's right, Father. You just keep eating shit, and the Brits and the Unionists will just keep on feeding to you. I think I'd prefer to drink somewhere where people have blood in their veins, not water. Water! You dirty little swine. Have you no wine blood's 40 proof? <laughs> Besides, this is a party.
<laughs> they will when they're all over the pavement. You're disgusting, Daniel. You know, I think we're even better drinkers than footballers. In fact, I think drinking should become an official sport. Yeah, like in the Olympics. Exactly. I mean, who cares about chucking javelins and jumping over poles? It's boring, but a couple of fellas trying to make a bit of toast and marmite after two bottles of Jameson's? Now that would be worth watching. Oh, let's see, it's certainly in Chris Ireland's chances that would be cool. Exactly. The Drinkers Olympics. Imagine the events. Trying to fit a key in a cue pole. Aiming <laughs> at the toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, brushing your teeth and realizing you're using the cream for your dad's hemorrhoids. <laughs>
Chinchu is dead. Chinchu, no! A gang of loyalists took him off the street. Random murder, the police call it. In reply to the IRA bombings. Bastards. Murderous, proddy, swine. He was last seen outside Daniel's place at around 1 a.m. and found this morning in the hills. Trussed up in a sack. The police don't know what exactly happened to him during those seven hours, except that he was tortured. And then he was alive when they found him. Just, they must have thought he was dead. But he wasn't. He was still alive. He must have been faking it. Glad we won the final. A milkman found him. A bloody milkman! He only kissed me last night. He kissed me for the first time. And the last. Are you coming, Daniel? You too, John. What? I said. Are you coming? Where? Where are you going, Thomas? Father, have you heard? Yes, Mary, I heard. I've come to talk with all of you. All of your comfort. Comfort? What good is comfort going to do? Call it counsel, then, Thomas. A boy is dead. We want no more killing. Is that right? And what do you think Ginger died for? He didn't die for anything. He died for nothing. He died for United Ireland. He died because he was alone and half drunk at night and he got in front of some psychotic hooligans. He died because Belfast is turning into a lunatic asylum. You be careful what you say about our martyrs, Father. Oh, so Ginger's a martyr already? It's time to do right by Ginger. It's time to kick a few karate. And you know which ones killed him then? Does it matter? They're all the same. They are all the enemy. Don't be insane, Thomas. That's how Ginger hurry! to hurt anybody, but because he was born Catholic. <coughs> and now you want to do the same to some poor Protestant boy. Yes. We have to do something, Father. We can't just let him die. Daniel, he's dead. He never had a violent bone in his body. He wanted to love. He wanted to love me. So just you look, Thomas. And you too, Daniel. If you go out now looking for trouble, it's got nothing to do with anybody but yourself. Not for your love of your friend, but for your love of hate. Are you coming, Dad, John? No, Thomas. I'm not coming. Coward! <laughs>
right. <laughs>
my cherry this very first time. <laughs> descends upon this tortured city. The security force is powerless to halt the cycle of tit for tat violence. As huge from both communities roam the city at will, often clashing with soldiers and the police. The very air seems to shiver with savagery and fear. Yeah, well, don't play count on me, alright? This is my 
wedding night, you bastard. My sodding wedding night. I know, John, but the struggle is Spare me the ballad of 1916. I think it's shit. Just tell me what you want so I can get back to my wife and never, ever ask me to do something like this again. For Christ's sake, John, keep your voice down. You have a gun, but no glasses. Well, don't you think that's a bit of a dangerous combination? I can still tell Army Khaki what I need to, John. I can see that your wife of yours is an addict with a peace and love talk. Don't get me wrong, the marriage one of those people who want freedom and justice, but isn't prepared to fight for it. Yeah? Maybe she just doesn't have a taste for murder. Did you ever think about that, Thomas? When you fight for freedom, it isn't murder. It's war. People die in wars. Maybe even me. I certainly don't want to die, John. But I do know one thing. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees.
And that baby grows up, Miss Big Warner, whose side will he be on? Who will he fight for? He won't fight for anyone if I have anything to do about it. Sure he will. He'll be an Irishman for all he's a half-breed bastard. And all Irishmen must have a side. It's a historical fact. History, my arts. How long can you carry a grudge? Well, there's a Brit or a union slept in Ireland, and there's you, breeding with them, making little Irish soldiers to fight for the Queen, to kill true Irish men. You're a whore, Christine Warner. A whore and a traitor. And you're a couple of sad, dried-up, vinegar-titted old slappers. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else, my darlings. When I've made my millions in America, I'm going to come back here, buy a house next door to yours, and run out to half a dozen bloody Protestants. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't hold back, Chrissy. Tell them what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all set then. I've seen our container down to the docks. And I say our container. But it really means hers. Because 95% of the crap we're bringing belongs to her. <laughs> so it seems we're all leaving then, Mary. Christine and I for New York, and you and John for Liverpool. He passes his football trial. Of course he's going to pass. I used to play with him, and I never got to touch the bloody ball. I know how tough it must be for you leaving it all. I know how much you love this place. Well, England's not that far away. And in any case, there are more Irishmen in Liverpool. Bloody mix. We get everywhere. We have to. Listen, will you come say goodbye to John before you go? No, Mary. I shan't. Thomas Malloy warned me off that track two years ago. That's a dangerous man to ignore. Perhaps the best if we just say goodbye to you, Mary. We wouldn't want to make John's day harder for him. You tell him good luck from the three of us. He's going to be a rock star, of course. <laughs> Be sure to come and visit us in America. You come visit us in England. We will marry. Promise. Goodbye then. Goodbye.
right? I'm gonna have a tryout for Liverpool. I don't think that's very likely. Not unless the British decide to return them too. Hey Mike, they're Catholic. They won't be here forever. Really? Oh, 
say that, Mary. Never. John, you can't talk like this. You have a child coming. And it will be born into an occupied country. We're at war, Mary. We've been at war for 800 years. I thought you didn't hold with politics. I do now. Hide my face from this bastard. What? Daniel Gillen, 
You've been tried and found guilty of the crime of treason. What are you talking about? Only you knew that John Kelly aided my escape that night. You were the only one he told. I knew, Thomas. We took a view that you wouldn't turn in your own man. No. Traitor is Daniel. He turned in John Kelly. I did. I wouldn't. Why? For a reason can I have? You're a thief, Gillen. A thief and a drug dealer. Everybody knows it. Even the police. But they would rather bang up a Republican soldier like John than an anti-social little maggot like you. So you offered them a trade. That's a lie, Mary. Is that why you paid me the money? No. You bought your freedom with the liberty of a decent man, Gillen. The sentence is kneecapping. No! To be carried out forthwith. You're insane! In the yard! I'll leave! I'll go away! Thomas, Run. this is insane! You've known Daniel your whole life! Ah. What have you done, Thomas? What have you become? Try to understand, Mary. This is war. That it isn't one worth fighting. We say that justice is our aim, but what does that justice mean? Condemned without trial, no chance of denial to Yeah. 
generation didn't get to play games. You'll turn into Thomas in the end. You know that, don't you? Ordering without a thought without pity. I'm a soldier now, Mary, and soldiers kill.
You're a traitor, Thomas. And what does that mean in a war like ours? A dirty war, an underground war. It's an honorable war. There's no honor in our war. We don't have the luxury. We're Catholic, yet we take guns from Soviet communists. We're socialist, but we'll still take money from Yankee businessmen. The Brits won't talk to us, but they'll invite us to Downing Street. We won't talk to them, but we'll send a man just the same. You did a deal with the police. This whole damn war is a deal. This is a bigger, deeper game than you poor bloody infantry can even imagine. Betrayal is just a part of the strategy. That is the nature of insurrection, of revolution. But why? Why betray me? Connections must be maintained. The beast needs feeding, so I fed them you. How do you think it worked? We just keep bashing the Brits until we win? Something like that, yes. Don't be so bloody naive. We will never win, because this war, it's never gonna end. We will never surrender, and neither will they. We're not fighting to win. We're fighting to keep the other side from winning. If that were the case, Thomas, then it wouldn't matter which side we were on. That's it. Now you're getting it. Now you're talking like a revolutionary. If we can ensure that the struggle passes on to the next generation, we've won. Can it ever end? Will it ever end? First we must learn how to forgive. So let's not pretend it will never end.
a reminder of who you were when you began. There's a world full of hatred out there. Don't let it corrupt you. Don't let it defeat you. Stay true to yourself and to the promise of your youth. This is who you are. It's up to you.
your misfortune to have come on opening night when they have to do a bunch of thank yous and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I wish it Yeah, I can go first. Um, so we have a lot of people that uh, we couldn't do this show without. So uh, we do have some things for you guys. So I would like the band to come and join us. We have gifts for you. But until then, um, we have some other people. Uh, I don't know if they're all here tonight, but uh, we'll give it a try. So, uh, Mr. Grunner, who did our voiceovers, you know, that you heard, like, for the news announcers. <laughs> Uh, Edgar Allan Poe. What's the type of theater you called it? Um, it's a classic theater. 
eclectic theater. So if you know what that means, come and find out. <laughs> um, uh, and then I wanted to do this. Uh, closing night's always really sad because you know the cast is a family, the crew's a family. I get attached. I, I do miss my daughter though, so I'm <laughs> so going to see her a lot more, and that's nice. But I do want to do this because it's very important. Uh, the grade twelves are leaders, and the drama program has blossomed in the last two, three years because of these students. And like we're saying goodbye to them soon. A couple of our uh, uh, grade twelve actors are in my own TA, my home room, so I'm you know doubly heartbroken. But I want all the grade twelves to come to the front and just take a bow, so we know who you are. And it always feels like you're never ever going to be able to replace them, and of course you always do. And <laughs> Congratulations to Mr. Heffernan and Mr. Nogueira and Ryan back here, who are a big part of that success. Can you give them a round of applause? <laughs> and so I thought that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to top any of that, and uh, maybe in the drama equivalent, we've done that tonight. This was absolutely an epic production in terms of the depth of the production, the quality of the performance, uh, the backstage people that did a great job, and of course the star, Celeste who who sang so beautifully tonight, congratulations. <laughs> as a tech, uh, tech expert, but now he's right on the stage, he did an outstanding job. And of course, uh, part of the band and of course tonight's performance was also Mr. Nagara, uh, who's been such an inspiration to both the band and to the drama. Rather an eclectic fellow. And it almost inspires me, Gavin, I think next time I'm going to have to help edit the script, so... <laughs> Jameson, so it's back there. <laughs> 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 